My name is Ryan Dong Nguyen, and I'm a sophomore at the college studying history and literature and government. I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Now take a moment to silence your cell phones. Now take your seats and join me in a round of applause for Tarina Ahuja, the IOP Director of Diversity and Outreach. Ryan. Hi everyone, how's everybody doing? Awesome? Amazing! Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. We are so incredibly excited to have you here today. My name is Tarina Ahuja and I'm a junior at the college studying political empathy and also have the honor of serving as the Institute of Politics Director of Diversity and Outreach. Joni Madison, Interim President of the Human Rights Campaign, said it beautifully when she said National Coming Out Day exists to promote a safe, inclusive, and loving world for LGBTQ plus people so that it can live truthfully, openly, and without fear. She added that coming out isn't something you do once. It's a decision made every single day. Today, we celebrate the lives, stories, and dreams of LGBTQ plus communities across the country. We live in a terrifying moment, a moment where lives are under attack. And the people we have the honor of hearing from today are individuals who have dedicated their lives to being uplifters, amplifiers, and blazers of many beautiful trails. And we are immensely lucky to get to hear from them. Keith Boykin is an American broadcaster, journalist, author, and political commentator. He was a CNN political commentator and a co-host of the BET TV talk show, My Two Cents. He's also author of five books, one of which comes out tomorrow, which is called Quitting, and Why I Left My Job to Live a Life of Freedom. He also co-founded the National Black Justice Coalition. Ian Daniel is a filmmaker, writer, curator, and producer. He served as the co-host and executive producer on Viceland's Emmy-nominated TV show, Gaycation. Gaycation followed Daniel and his co-host, actor Elliot Page, around the world as they explore LGBTQ rights and culture. He is currently an Ash Fellow here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Sally Cohn is one of the leading progressive voices in America today. A frequent guest on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, Sally's first book, The Opposite of Hate, was published in April 2018. Cohen is a popular keynote speaker and is on the board of contributors for USA Today and a contributing editor to Afar Magazine. Cohen is also a TED curator, and her three hit TED Talks have been viewed more than six million times. Holly Ryan is the first openly transgender woman elected to the Newton City Council. A committed Democrat, she serves as co-chair of the Massachusetts Democrat Party's LGBTQ plus caucus, a board member of the Bay State Stonewall Democrats, and was instrumental in creating dedicated seats on the Democratic State Committee for Trans Individuals. She is also the founder of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. Xander Moritz is the executive director at the Social Equity and Education, C, initiative, and plaintiff in the Don't Say Gay lawsuit. Since 2019, Xander has grown the C Initiative into a movement of over 2,000 organizers across the United States. In his home state of Florida, the initiative is leading the student response to hateful legislation through mass organizing and campaign work. He is a first year at the college and somebody that I am incredibly lucky to call a friend. And finally, moderating this incredible panel will be the incredible David Grasso, somebody I have gotten to know over the last few months. David Grasso is the CEO of Bold TV Incorporated, a nonprofit media company dedicated to entrepreneurship and cultural empowerment, especially targeted at millennials and Generation Z. He is also the host of the Follow the Profit podcast, where he shares simple ideas for financial success and lessons learned the hard way. He is also one of the co-chairs of the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Pride Caucus. So please give a warm round of applause for these incredible speakers.
Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing out there? So only a generation ago, this would have been considered impossible. And here we are, we are so blessed to live in a different time where we can celebrate who we are and as who we're becoming over time. I believe you heard already a lot about our panelists. So I'm just gonna jump right in here and I'm gonna do something unconventional. Xander, I hear you're 18 years old, is Correct. that true? Yeah, it wow. is, it is. Yeah, and uh, how was the coming out experience for you? I believe I read about it on NBC News. Um, <laughs> The coming out experience for me was, as it is for everyone, really weird and unique and not at the right time, even though there is no right time. Um, I came out using a PowerPoint presentation that I hooked <laughs> up um, to my TV, where we walked through the definition of sex and gender, things you couldn't say, questions you couldn't ask, things that you could say, uh, celebrities you could say, like, oh, you're like that. Um, just little balances that we felt appropriate. But um, I think the more important context to my coming out experience was the community that was held in school and then the community that was outside of it. So I'm from Sarasota County, which is the first school district uh, in our country to initiate an outing policy. So teachers are required to out students to their parents if they identify themselves as queer or change of pronouns. <coughs> And so as a county and as a political culture, it was very aggressive, it was not very understanding. But as a school community, kind of what we're observing everywhere is that the incoming generations are more progressive and there are more inclusive thought processes and the conversations happen more naturally and students feel more comfortable. And that was the situation for me. So the first person I ever came out to was actually a teacher and the first people I ever came out to was at school. And I think that's why when we see this sacred, safe, guaranteed space being polluted for so many children, mm -hmm. what you're seeing is that loss of an opportunity to have a community that is accepting and that will allow you to nurture and identify your identity. I don't think I could have strung a sentence that well together when I was your age. So congratulations <laughs> to you, Xander. Uh -huh. So Holly, you had quite a different experience coming out, didn't you? Yeah, <coughs> um, I've been out for well, officially for 29 years, um, the Department of Public Health asked me, Massachusetts asked me to do some trainings on the denial of access um, to the LGBTQ community. At the time, it was the LGBT community. Of course, I had the transgender piece. And this is when hospitals and detoxes and halfway houses were slamming the door in people's faces and saying they couldn't get treatment there. So at the time, I was still kind of in the closet, so it pushed me out anyway. And, um, and then I became an activist leader in Massachusetts, uh, one of the founders of Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. And I'm an out trans person. I choose to be <coughs> out because I can fight the fight where a lot of people can't. And uh, we can never disparage people if to, if they're not out and they don't feel comfortable being out, let me speak for you. Mm. Well, Holly, I feel like the whole country owes you an apology for cheap political tricks, you know, <laughs> based on your identity. Yeah. Keith, you've been out for quite a long time. 30. Are you saying he's old? Sorry, was that that? I knew Sally was going to tease me. That's why I was going to her last. <laughs> 31 years, actually. What was it like back then? Uh, <laughs> back, Once upon a time. Back in the old days. Right? Yes. Um, well, I was here. Um, I came out at Harvard Law School, Harvard Law School in 1991, um, and I came out in an interesting way because I went to a book. There, is there still a bookstore in Harvard Square? The Coop. Oh, there was a real bookstore in Harvard Square okay. <laughs> before that. Um, and I went to a bookstore and I picked up a book in what was in the gay section. There was no LGBTQ section; it was just the gay section. And nervously looked through some <coughs> of the pages and took it to the counter and purchased it, slipped in my back backpack, took it home and read the entire book that night and immediately came out to myself. And the next day I came out to my mom and called her up in Texas and had a difficult conversation with her and finally managed to tell her that I'm gay. Um, and she reacted positively. She told me that she loved me and she asked some questions. She said, are you sure? Um, you know, maybe it was something I did and have you met the right woman perhaps? And I told her exactly what it was and was not. Um, and um, it was mostly a positive experience for me because it was here at Harvard. Um, but the only negative experience I actually had was also here at Harvard because when my grandmother came to my graduation from law school 30 years ago, um, she confronted my boyfriend and told him that she did not approve of my, what she called my lifestyle. And she insisted that my, that my boyfriend uh, 
give to her his mother's telephone number or something like that so she could call his mother. And I was on stage, you know, getting my degree when all this was happening. So it was, it was just, a, it was a very interesting, difficult uh, experience. It was mostly positive and it, it helped to set up a lot of different positive things to happen for me in life. And the one last thing I'll just say about it is I remember <laughs> sitting up there, I think like up in that row somewhere, in 1991, shortly after it came out, when Bill Clinton came to speak on campus. And um, someone who was sitting down here asked him for the first time ever if he would be in favor of lifting the ban on gays in the military. And he said yes. And that was the first time he'd ever heard the question. And I was so impressed by his answer, I decided to go work for him. So I went and decided to, after I graduated from law school, I went to work for Bill Clinton and became a special assistant to the president in the White House. A lot of history has happened right here in the forum. So Sally, you're all perked up over there. What's your coming out story? Tell us more. Yeah. Um, I like everyone else's. Uh, okay, mine was, I don't know. What's the adjective? Weird? Uh, I don't know. Here's mine. You decide what adjective you think fits. Uh, I was 16 years old. Uh, and my best friend said one day, I'm gay. And it like took me a second. I was like, oh, every, it's like all the puzzle pieces came into, I'm like, well, that explains so much. I think I am too. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, by the way, that I love coming out, every coming out day. So hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Still very gay. I like to think I get gayer and gayer <laughs> every year. Um, <laughs> And so I told, the first people I told, other than said uh, friend who became girlfriend, who became high school sweetheart, who became college and law school girlfriend, that's a road we shouldn't have headed down, but that's neither here nor there. It all ended fine. Mm -hmm. um, as I told my parents, actually, you know what's funny? I never told my dad. I just realized I should call him later. Anyway, um, I, told, <laughs> uh, I told my mom, there was sort of a lot of sobbing, you know, I told my mom and my mom was like, we knew. And they did because when I was 11 years old, true story, unlike everything else I'm saying, pile of lies. Uh, true story, when I was 11 years old, they had my handwriting analyzed because my mom was a little foofy woo woo and believed in such things. Uh, and uh, the handwriting analyst was like, you know, she's a perfectionist, she's a little neurotic. Oh, and by the way, she might be gay. From your handwriting? I know. <laughs> Who the hell knows, what right? What is gay handwriting, <laughs> Sally? <laughs> Later, if anyone would like to see my very like gay handwriting, yeah, let me know. <laughs> um, and so what's funny is from there on after, suddenly there was like a lot of Lily Tomlin in my family's media consumption, uh, you know. But anyway, my parents knew. And what that did for me uh, was, by, and by the way, I just wanna say for anyone else who happens to have parents in the room, um, or I mean not in the room, but who has parents and you're in this room, mine are by far the most supportive parents of a queer kid on the planet. I think they decided that anything they screwed up when I was a kid, they were gonna make it up for every other <laughs> queer kid. So they like, moder they uh, chaperoned the gay prom, they helped found the LGBTQ community center, they started two P-flag chapters, my dad joined a gay car club, I didn't even know that was a thing. My mom took the lesbian art history appreciation class, they a just lot went of all out. Georgia O'Keeffe, I imagine. <laughs> but what I will say, which is unique about my experience, is right when people talk about a lot of parents, when they're concerned about their kids, they're worried, like, well, what's going to happen to you in the world? We were talking about this a little backstage. What's going to happen to you in the world? And what people don't realize is the most important acceptance and love and nurture you can get is from your parents. Because as long as your parents got you, you're good. At the same time, I had this very jarring experience because my girlfriend's parents, who I thought were these like paragons of progressive, they were like these radical Jews who had helped like, you know, register voters in the 60s in the South, and they were always so political and so engaged, and I thought they were so cool, and they were awful. And having that jarring experience where on the one hand, I didn't for a second, for a second, feel bad being gay. It was never an issue in my own family. And yet I also learned, what does it mean to be judged for who you are? What does it mean to be a progressive hypocrite? To not, right, like, 
to not apply your values equally to all people, and right? That became such an instructive juxtaposition for me going forward. Awesome, so Ian, you're a documentarian. You've been all around the country, and in fact, in Canada as well. Tell us about your work and about the idea of coming out through media and your work. Um, yeah, um, I am a documentarian, and um, I think that a lot of my coming out happened on TV, because on vacation I kind of, I mean, I was already out to my, to my mother and to my immediate family, but I wasn't like out to everyone in high school or to the frat that I was in or anyone in Indiana, my conservative hometown. So um, it was like, okay, I'm on TV and the show's called Gaycation and we're all gay um, or queer or L LGBTQ. And, um, and I think then I just kind of had to embrace the impact for people's viewpoints around uh, like my immediate, my extended family, my, my friends from high school. Um, and yeah, so I had this unusual sort of like public coming out and just it got it out of the way really, really quickly, I guess. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I think I learned making vacation where you're traveling over to over to over 10 countries. Um, then in, in many countries, 80 countries, it's illegal to be gay. Um, so coming out is not even a possibility. And I think we need to acknowledge that coming out is different for many different people. For some people, it's a joyful, celebratory experience for some of, uh, some of us on stage today. Um, for some people, it's really despairing um, because they risk violation, they risk violence, they, they risk death. Um, and I think we see those cases through the, the films that I made and, and we read about them online. So um, it's, with the despair, we also have to focus on the triumph. And I think uh, in despairing times, we also have to focus on community and creating community and, and, and finding ways in which we can all come together to sort of uh, rebel against these um, colonial constructs, really. So I think you see how coming out, um, you just see the impacts of colonization on, on queerness, right? And um, whereas in indigenous communities or pre-colonization, there, um, there was room for uh, non-binary people, two-spirit people, trans people. They were centered in the community. They were considered sacred. Uh, and through colonization, there was a violation of that sacredness. and and now we have to sort of like come out and, um, and state who we are versus it just being a natural flow of our existence, right? Um, so I think you see the ramifications of that over, uh, all around the world. Um, did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah, 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 you did. You're fantastic. So Xander, you have curly hair, don't you? I do. Tell I us do. about your curly hair and the, the, the crazy allegory that you use. I believe you were valedictorian at, is it Pineview High School? Uh, class president. I'm going to cough. I've been holding a cough the whole time. I'm yeah, sorry. you can cough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. As long as it's not COVID, we're good. Right, no, we're clear. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I'm from Florida. Don't say gay law. It's horrible. It's a terrible mess. But a lot of people don't really understand the full scope of ramifications that the legislation has. Uh, and that's because of what is called its enforcement mechanism. So what, how this law is held accountable is that any parent of any school district can sue that school district if they feel as though their child hasn't experienced um, that law being invalidated in their experience. And so what that means is that all of these teachers, all of these school district officials, all of these school administrators in Florida, like think about a Florida parent for a second, now have to think about what could happen if a single parent is angry at them or if they feel as though their child is not receiving the specific type of education that that parent wants. Now what you have are all of these educators and educational professionals freaking out preemptively about what could happen if a parent is angry. So what they choose to do instead of push the law or really find where the language allows them to teach their children freely is they panic and they think any way that that law can be interpreted, I need to take care of, I need to fit within the guidelines. And so several months before the law went into effect, there was this chilling spread across Florida schools of people tearing down posters and putting away pictures and HR meetings being held at 7 p.m. where the guidance counselors walking through what you can and cannot say in an email. And there's this massive uprising of fear in schools because educators are not able to do their jobs correctly when they're being restricted in this capacity. And so what happened was even before the law had gone into effect, uh, my principal called me in to his office and he essentially told me that I could not discuss my sexual identity or any of my activism around that. 
Um, and a lot of people think that this little moment is where my activism began, but the larger context is that he was upset about the potential for me to talk about my activism because it had become so polarized in that community. So kind of like what I brought up earlier, there was this really interesting dynamic between my school community and my actual greater community where I was really supported, where I had a great team, and then where I was really opposed and I was receiving death threats. And I mean, I'm 18 and my lawyer said, okay, well, we're gonna get you a security team so you don't like die while going to get gas. And so when you're operating in this really weird dynamic, um, the principal thought that there would be um, some type of violent event. And so he said, you cannot talk about any of your activism, you cannot talk about your identity, you cannot talk about anything that could set something off because he knows, due to all of that activism, that I'm the exact type of person to you know, set something off. Um, and obviously I'm heartbroken, right? Like my principal has just told me that I don't deserve to be celebrated and that if I am to bring my identity into my school setting, that it's going to ruin the celebration for so many families. And so immediately I work with the C initiative and we start a statewide sticker campaign where in 48 hours we got 10,000 Sega stickers shipped to students across the state. Like every single one was claimed by an individual student and it was incredible. We got this immediate movement going and all of this energy. And while this is happening, while this movement is spreading across the state, it's getting like significantly worse in my community because there was those fears of that potential attack or something going wrong a rumor essentially started that my principal would have to wear a bulletproof vest during graduation, and no one, like administration did not say anything. And so what happens is press vans start rolling up during lunch, and everyone's losing their mind, and people are calling their parents and saying, don't come to graduation, you'll get shot, and it's Sanders' fault. And then there are voicemails coming into the school from everyone across the internet scolding my principal, which, right, like you think it helps because you're trying to point <coughs> what they're doing wrong out, but instead that just builds into the entire circus of what's happening. So I'm starting a statewide movement and then right in my county, everyone's exploding and it feels so dangerous. And I recognize that while I'm encouraging everyone everywhere to stand up, speak out, be true, that if I am directly, if I'm direct about who I am and what I'm doing, something actually might happen now. Something really dangerous could go down and this is still a celebration that I have earned and that several hundred of my friends have earned and so I'm sitting here and I have to balance these two really just, I, there's, there was no question of, oh, what, which one am I gonna pick? It's impossible. I cannot not defend my human rights and who I am and support my own movement. And I also can't risk losing my life. And so we, I, I sit there and I actually had to write the speech. I don't know if I said this a lot, but I had to write the speech in a single day because they made us change everything. Um, so I had one day to send in a new draft or I didn't get to speak at all. And I sat there for the longest time and I originally was gonna write about a pimple. And it was supposed to be that my sexuality is a large pimple on my forehead and no matter what I do, I, I can't stop anyone from looking at it, I can't control it. If I try to squeeze it or make it go away, it just gets worse. <laughs> um, right, and I'm reflecting on what y'all are reflecting on, which is, oh my God, that's so gross. Like. <laughs> Imagine if I got up on that graduation stage and was like, look, um, and I kind of just sat there and there was no grand moment, but I was literally just like touching my hair on my forehead. And I was like, oh, I will talk about my hair instead. Like I'll just talk about my hair. Um, and so I get up and I deliver a speech about how Florida's climate makes it very difficult to have curly hair. And I've spent a long time trying to straighten myself and try to correct this part of my identity. But no matter what I do, it's just a part of who I am and there are going to be so many curly-haired kids in Florida who have to try to change who they are, and it's going to be harmful. Like, have y'all ever tried to straighten curly hair? It turns into a mess, it's gonna be harmful. And I kind of deliver that speech, and the effects were just unbelievable, and I don't think it's because there was anything revolutionary said in that speech. I mean, it was the exact same thing, but in a different way. I think what made the difference is, for so many people, one, the ridiculous, hilarious, pathetic nature of these laws was put on an indisputable pedestal. Like I'm literally sitting here talking about my curly hair and you all recognize what's going on. Isn't that stupid? I'm 18 years old. Isn't this ridiculous? And everyone felt how Who's ridiculous Who's the adult it was. in the room, Xander, No, right? exactly, yeah. right? Where are the 30 adults in the room? Um, sitting on the stage with me and they all passed it. And it was just, oh, that was another thing. The school board members were up on the stage with me and the only one absent was one of the ones that had written that legislation, which is 
really wild, but she, she and I have beefed for a while. Shocker. So do we live in a bubble, Sally? Wait, sorry, what was the question? You had a great experience. Do we live in a bubble? It seems like it's, it's like people like Xander are being censored in Florida. I'm from Florida. I mean, I would have been expelled back in the day for being gay from my school because I went to a Christian high school. Are there still a lot of people like that in Indiana or, yeah. you know, abroad? Are we living, are we privileged? Well, yes. Um, and uh, yes. And look, I mean, half the question is <coughs> I, you know, to Ian's point, I have no doubt that I had a fairly unique and wonderful uh, coming out experience and just general experience with such queer supportive parents. It is also very cool to realize that, that like to, it is, it is inspiring to me and I hope inspiring to others to see that that's possible. Like I, don't worry, I got plenty of other issues. Plenty, that's for a different panel. But my queerness just isn't one of them. Like I've never, and I, I know how fortunate I am. I have never woken up a single day in my life ever where I felt anything other than completely, totally lucky to be queer. So yes, that is a bubble. On the other hand, what is also true and I think is important to remember in this moment, and look, I mean, on the other hand, I wake up most days these, you know, mornings these days, very worried and despondent about other things. Um, and there is no question, we are in a dark moment in history, in our country, in the world. And I don't wanna, this is not to downplay that at all. I also think that when we look at certainly what's happening in our own domestic politics, uh, you know, the, the, the blowback, the rollback of rights, uh, the extreme and sort of emboldened opposition, there is no doubt in my mind or in my heart that one of the reasons that's happening is because, as a general rule, we have made so much progress. Things are better, they're not great. They're not great, they're not perfect in any way, shape, or form, in any category, with respect to any identity that we can think of. But the idea that we have, that we are a more just country today than, well not maybe today, but like, you know, in this decade than we were 100 years ago, that we have become a more inclusive conversation, a country that we were starting to have conversations about historical injustices, uh, and structural inequalities that we had never really worked on redressing and we were finally having a conversation, and a conversation, by the way, that didn't feel like it was on the fringe, that was starting to become a real majoritarian conversation, a real transformative force, and we were winning that, that look, the backlash has to be a backlash against something. It doesn't mean we just get to sit here and trust that the arc of the universe is gonna keep bending toward justice, we have to bend it, but that to me is I don't even want to call it a, a privilege or just a little light, a hope, like that we can all feel, I'd still rather be alive in this moment. Even though there's more fighting to be done, it's getting uglier by the day, it's gonna get darker before it gets better. But there is something in that we were, we were, do, we were doing better. We were doing better as a country, we were doing better as a people, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. So Keith, I see politics right there, so you're from politics, so maybe we should talk about that. Where are we politically? <clears throat> well, Sally indicated that we are in a very dark place, and we are in a dark place in this country. Um, and I agree with her about the de demographic changes which are fueling a lot of that, that fear that's out there in the country. In fact, my last book that came out last year was called Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America. And um, what has happened is that we have a country now where we've had a black president for eight years. We now have a black woman vice president. We have a black woman on the Supreme Court for the first time. We have LGBTQ equality in many states, marriage equality in all states. Uh, we're starting to have more rights for trans people in this country than we've ever had in this country. We have the Hispanic population, which is growing more rapid, so rapidly that in five states, Hispanics will be the majority in the next three decades. We have the Asian American community, which is growing more rapidly than any other segment of the population. 
All those things are freaking the hell out of people who are traditional white Christian conservative Republicans and others who just don't like the idea of America becoming this multicultural, multi uh, diverse, pluralistic society. And that's the backlash we're seeing. That's why it's so scary for a lot of people. But as, as a black man, and a black gay man, I, I think a lot of people in the black community, we've been feeling this for hundreds of years. Uh, there was never a time when we felt, for most of us, when we felt safe in this country. Uh, and so uh, I've never had the experience of waking up every day in this country and feeling like I was, I was safe. Never had that experience in any, in any point of my life, even, after, even going to Harvard. And um, even though I had a, a very accepting experience for me when I came out to my mom and my family, except for my grandmother, my best friend here at the law school who went to Harvard undergrad, he's Jamaican, his family disowned him because of his sexual orientation. He, had, he just this year saw his mom for the first time since we graduated from law school. That's heartbreaking. Yes, and um, you know, it, it's not easy for everyone, for a lot of people in black communities, the, the, the whole idea of coming out is antithetical to our existence because, for, for, well, first of all, backing up, I was a co-founder of an organization called the National Black Justice Coalition, which is a black LGBTQ organization. And they've been helping to move the conversation away from just coming out to a concept called inviting in, which is not so much about coming out to everyone, but it's about inviting people who you choose to allow into your space. Uh, and the difference is that it gives you some more agency and it also recognizes the differences from community to community, that black and brown experiences may not be the same as experiences for, for white people, for example. And I also know from personal life experience that racism exists in the LGBTQ community. Just a few years ago, I had to file a lawsuit against a gay club in New York City uh, in the middle of Manhattan because they had discriminatory door policies. I went on one day when there was a mostly white clientele and walked right in. I went on another day when it was a mostly black clientele and had to be frisked and searched just to walk into the same club. And I asked the manager about it and he told me, well, you know, black people are different. He openly admitted it to me, so I, because I'm a lawyer, I sent him an email the next day and he said the same thing to me, openly admitted it. So I sued him and, and they lost the case, of course, because it was clearly racial discrimination. And this is happening in the 21st century in our communities. So a lot of people, people like me who are African American or people of color, we don't necessarily have the same refuge because we can't necessarily go to the quote unquote gay ghettos of West Hollywood or, or the village or Chelsea in New York or Boys Town in Chicago and have a sense of complete comfort. And we can't always be completely comfortable in our African American communities as well. So the, the trouble for us is finding a space where we can be uniquely ourselves and be accepted and respected uh, and not be subjected to bias from either community. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Keith, because Ian, you wanted to mention your work in anti-racism and how it pertains to the LGBTQ community. Well, more so, I think I, um, I'll say my work per se, but I think just the general concept of what's happening at Harvard, um, because I think that there, there's been a group of us that have come together because there's been sort of a history of violence that's happened here, and uh, especially towards marginalized people. Um, and even recently, over the past two months, there was a letter that was sent out toward the LGBT community that, um, you know, was a death threat, basically. And um, I did get to read the letter, which was so discouraging because it was so well written and so poetic and so pointed. And it, it, it was so jarring to read that, um, that there would be people here that would um, so violently target a community. But then you start looking back at the history of, of these groups and, and the institution in general, and you see that this is happening to, to every uh, marginalized community. So in 2020, there were similar threats to the black community and black students. And, um, and just a real history of sort of anti-racism on campus and anti-LGBT anti and um, you name it. And so I think that all of these things are so intersectional and they, they, they require intersectional solutions and they, they require that, um, that I, I think that when I talk about anti-racism, it's because it's centered, if you work underneath that umbrella that we work toward being an anti-racist society, um, then a lot of things fall in line. So I think that what we're working on here is just kind of connecting the dots to see how, how does the institution deal with these violent threats. I think what we're finding is, is that they, they don't really. 
um, in an institutional sense. Um, there's a lot of performance, there's a lot of conversation about it, but when you ask about actual systemic changes, there's a lot of sort of, uh, it's like walking around in a labyrinth, right? Like finding the door to, to a yes or to a change. And so it can be very frustrating um, to come to a school, I think sometimes where you think there's progressive values at play, right? That the branding is that we are a social justice, uh, we are social justice forward and leaders. And then you get here and it's kind of like a scre car screeching, like, wait a minute, um, I've already had to deal with anti-LGBT discrimination coming from conservative Indiana. Um, I've already traveled around the world and seen like death threats happen to so many people and people lose their lives and get thrown on the street. And I was not expecting to come to Harvard and hear these threatening uh, statements and hear them from even my classmates, the bigotry. Um, and so I think we have a real issue here. And I think that, that that's just indicative of America, right? We're in a white supremacist institution that centers certain voices over others. And I think that, you know, I, I'm not, I think we have to talk about those systemic issues when we talk about coming out, which is um, how do we how do we co how do we coexist in a in a space that is violent and also uh, express joy and express celebration. And my only solution to that is, it, the more I think about it, is like transparency in a in a world that gatekeeps um, interdisciplinary connections in a world that is super siloed. Um, I think about community. And I think there's a lot of scholarship around community as a verb, right? Not just like stumbling upon LGBT people and I'm in a community. You have to create community. You have to make community. Um, and you do have to kind of cross over the, the boundaries of each other to, to create that space of, of freedom making, of, of, um, of communal rebellion, right? And so I think we're also in a period right now at Harvard where we don't really want to talk about activism. Because if you talk about activism, then it's not scholarly. Um, if you talk about activism, then don't you dare interrupt a classroom because um, we can't make those statements. And, right, that happened just the other day where people interrupted a classroom. And so now there are these statements that just came out. There's no activism on campus, but we can't, for me, I, I don't want to be put down in a corner. I didn't come here um, to accept the status quo, of white supremacy. Um, and, I, and I think that we have to understand as students or the students in the room that it's really up to you to make the shift, right? It's really up to you to make the changes here, and it does, it does work, and, and anti-racism is one case where students have made the changes. Um, they spoke up, they've been working for decades to get these changes to happen. The, the dean and other people said, no, we're not ready for that yet, but now there are required courses on race and decolonization and those things. So um, this needs to happen for LGBT people as well. There's, no, there's one to no courses on LGBT, people, uh, uh, LGBT issues here. Um, zero now at the Kennedy School. And so you're having people come from over 60 different countries with varying viewpoints, and it's, it's different here. And we don't accept uh, terminology that says that LGBT people should be going to hell or that um, being gay marriage is a sin or reading the email that said, you know, watch your back, we're going to be uh, coming for you, you we're, we're homophobic, we're anti-woke. So um, that's a long-winded <laughs> way to say that it, it requires like um, unique coalition building across intersections uh, to create solutions. Um, and that's what I've come up with after just being here for two months. Well, thank you. Thank you much. Uh, well, you got an applause. Evidently, that was the right answer. So, Holly, one of the most interesting things you told me in the reception was, I just want to be a local politician. I want to fill mm. potholes. I want to do the business of the people. But the media wants to make me that trans woman. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah, I, um, I was elected in 2019, and at the time I was the 27th transgender person in the nation to hold an office higher than school committee. I'm a city councilor in Newton. And I had a lot of press coverage, and uh, it was actually worldwide press coverage. Um, I had to have a friend of mine handle it. It was coming in so fast especially after I was elected the first month. And the reporters are always hopping on the fact that I am tr a transgender woman. And um, I kept saying, no, that's, I'm running because um, we need more affordable housing in the city of Newton. Um, 
In my area, the roads are a mess, or uh, the sidewalks, or um, we need more tree canopy, and we need to get in the ball with climate change and get off of fossil fuels. And I just happen to be a lifelong resident of Newton that is transgender. You know, that's not why. And uh, it's actually, that's a national, uh, that's the way we run, trans, the transgender community runs nationally, that we run on, on uh, the issues and we always steer the press and our detractors back to the issues. And we seem to be winning, there's now 100 plus transgender in only three years, 100 plus transgender people that are holding higher office and, and now in state reps and senators and uh, um, we made a lot, but um, as you can see around the country, um, and I'll wrap this up quick, we, um, you know, I, I feel all the work I've done in 30 years with a lot of other people, um, you know, when we didn't have anybody to look up to and we were told we didn't have anybody to look up to, that someday people would look up to us, other trans people and kids, um, that we had reached a point where we were part of society. I hold office, uh, people work, trans people work with everybody else, their teachers and doctors, and, um, and now, as you can see, uh, the pushback is awful and they're passing laws now to basically make us criminals and the parents of trans kids criminals. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we live in a bubble here, as we were talking about in Massachusetts, and I've even said myself, I'm glad I live here, but I fought people hard in this state and um, they're here and they're waiting to drag us down. Well, let's give our panelists a round of applause. If you have any questions, I'll be doing my thank yous now. There are far too many people to thank, so if you have any questions, please begin lining up at one of the microphones that you see scattered across the room. There are far too many people to thank for this event. I think I'm gonna mess this up, but I will just do it by people that I'm looking at. Harvard Alumni Relations, the Institute of Politics, the Undergrad Coffis, um, the Shorenstein Center. Uh, who am I missing? Lawul Goshu, this was his idea. Raise your hand. So one of the things about this event is we kind of forgot how to do events during COVID. Mm -hmm. So this has been a great exercise for this institution to get it right back on track. Uh, if you, we hope you are joining us for the dinner after. If you've RSVP'd, it will be at the faculty club starting at 7.30. We hope to see you there. In the meantime, do we have any questions for the panelists? I see a question back there. Uh, we have a policy at the IOP. Yes. It's tradition here. All questions must end in a question mark. And please direct your question at one of our panelists. Apologies, I wasn't aware of the policy, um, <laughs> but as a um, gay Jamaican, I uh, wanted to say that there is progress being made. It is slow, um, very, very, very slow, uh, and you see it through the courts, and um, the backlash hasn't really quite kicked in yet because it's, it's still flying under the radar, so what are some of the strategies, any, well, anyone can take this, I guess, that you would recommend for mitigating some of the inevitable backlash? Anyone, any takers? Backlash for legal pursuit of solvency? Yes. <coughs> I mean, for, for this is a little pursuit. on the nose for yeah. me. Um, I'm also a plaintiff in the Don't Say Gay lawsuit, and there's been a tremendous amount of backlash for our case. Um, like I said, um, there have been death threats and people in the community who will try to track me down or run it. Uh, my last name is Moritz, uh, and that's not a common last name, and so there will be proud boy people who go into my parents' place of work and uh, try to fight them into finding me or start a debate, and it's, it's scary and it's horrifying, and so 
the natural question is when you're trying to build a movement, when you're trying to legitimize a lot of these political gains, how do you prevent that spillover from hurting the people that are actually doing that work and that are organizing? I mean, we are 2,000 youth organizers. Something we think about on a daily basis is how do we keep these people that are in the streets safe? Because we're doing work every day and we're getting hundreds of other people involved every day. How do we keep them safe? And I think one of the automatic things is transparency along the entire legal process so that the community knows what is going on at all points. So if you're constantly sharing what's happening inside the room, if you're constantly showing what your politicians and representatives and what judges and what, ev what the lawyers, what, if you just put everything out there, if you show everything every step of the way, what people start to do is they start to become involved in the process and when there are these gains or when we do see legislation change, there's not an explosion to the reaction, there's more constant friction along the whole process and when people are involved on both sides, even if they're opposing it throughout the whole process, it prevents a lot of the violence on people that aren't explicitly involved because when you are breaking it down all the time, constantly showing cause and effect, the anger starts being directed back at the process and in a very twisted way, it <coughs> creates better civic engagement on both sides. Um, it's just a very difficult thing to do because none of the process is transparent for anyone. And, and I think what Ian was saying is very relevant because I look at the pictures of the politicians in Jamaica and I'm like, hey, I know these people. I went to school with them here, right? So what is the power that this institution could do to change things in places like Jamaica? Any takers? Well, I, I do want to respond to something you said too because I feel, uh, I just want to clarify what I was saying about my friend who was Jamaican. Um, and I'm not trying to suggest that, every, that Jamaica is, is alone in that respect or, or uniquely homophobic because I think America is homophobic and the country, the world is as well. Uh, but I do know that there are organizations that are there that people are working with, like JFLAG. Um, I do know that friends of mine like Stacey Ann Chen and Jasmine Kanick are working in Jamaica to try to make change with the, the people who are on the ground in the LGBTQ community. I've traveled to Jamaica myself and I've met with LGBTQ people there. I've traveled to Zimbabwe and worked with an organization called Gays and Lesbians in Zimbabwe at a time when Robert Mugabe, who was a dictator of, Z of Zimbabwe, was a very anti-gay homophobic leader. And I think what it takes is courage on the part of leaders in the community, but, but more importantly for people outside, support supporting those people who are doing the work in, on the ground in the communities. Um, and that's the only way to really make the change. I don't think you can ever eliminate the backlash. But I think if you support the people who are on the ground, they can at least have the resources to be able to challenge it. Well, there's so many, there's so many homeless uh, or unhoused youth in Jamaica, right? I mean, it's, it's different since uh, we filmed there many years ago, but it's a di really discouraging issue. Um, and a, a lot of the youth there are completely thrown out of their home and violated and acid thrown on them. And this, I mean, this was what we, we covered in vacation. And I know things are changing and JFLAG is doing amazing work and, and we were working with them through vacation. So I think, I think it's about, you know, you're in a privileged position, obviously being here. And I think it's extracting the resources from here and the best, you know, there's a lot of resources here. And, and I, think, I think especially those communities that are on the front lines that are literally on the street living in tents and tarps and fighting for asylum in these, fighting for asylum here. And then they get here and they can't get a job, they can't get the paperwork. Um, it, it's very difficult to get the mutual aid money um, on their own, right? And, and I think sometimes they, they do get asylum and they try to live out their true gender identity and they have such a history of violence, such a history of, of pain that is very difficult to acclimate, uh, especially in, if they're transitioning to be to, into a, a new gender, right? So it, uh, the, pull resources from here pull resources from your privilege to help those communities. And I think there's always going to be a backlash. There's always going to be people on the street that have no family, that have no community, that have no care. So we just have to work super, super hard to find ways to care for one another, to find mutual aid, to uh, create our own communities of, of care. Um. Thank you, Ian. We had a question over here. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, my name is Shannon O'Brien. Uh, speaking of pulling from our privilege, I really liked the distinction between coming out and inviting in. And when I worked at Harvard, I worked at the Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations. And one of our projects was creating images, paintings of people, uh, professors who were 
my, of, from minority communities. And I remember speaking to one of uh, the, the artist who made the paintings, and he said, well, we did a couple paintings of white people. And the reason we did that, for example, there was an admissions officer who was white. And he was responsible for the changing face of Harvard. So my question is about, um, as a straight person or straight people, how can we be an ally? How can we be an advocate? And how can we help to tap into the resources of our privilege? Great question, Sally. Help. You're always perked up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make us laugh, I right? Mean... <laughs> Listen, there's no joking about allies, okay? It's not funny. I'm not making a joke <laughs> about allies. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to tell you what I think. I, this is where I guess I feel old and maybe I'm not of the moment. But I come from a time, back in the Mesozoic era, <laughs> when allies were really important. And it's not, that's not something against um, building communities' own power and voice and leadership. And it's not a sort of plea for assimilation or anything like that, but it is a recognition that uh, one of the ways toward to change cultural norms and therefore political norms and academic policies and workplace policies and practices and all of these things is yes, to build the power of a community or communities uh, that have the most at stake in that change and also to build a universe of allies. And I, you know, I mentioned my parents before, I mean, I come really strongly out of the P-flag tradition, right? So for people who don't know, oh, no, parents and friends of lesbians and gays, I think now it's been changed, right? It's, I'm so old, I don't even remember. I like, think that's a 90s reference, No, no, right? no, no I know, but no, then? it still exists, <laughs> but now it has, it's still called P-flag, but it doesn't, Rep stand for P-flag anymore. Does anybody know what it now stands for? No. Nope. Still P-flag, right? You still use the letters, but it no longer is parents and friends of lesbian gays because they, anyway. I hate to break it to you, but you're like introducing P-flag to me okay, right Okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> My point here is. Thank you, Xander. <laughs> right? My point here is, is it was a place. It was a way, and there's a the metaphor in here. Just bear with me. But it was a place where parents who were like, hey, I'm, I, I love my kid, right? I want to figure out how to do the right thing, I'm struggling, but I, I can call someone, I can ask questions, I can, like, there is something about, so the path to being allies, right? Like, let me just tell you, I don't know about y'all, but I wasn't born knowing everything I know now, right? I'm not saying I'm perfect or that I know everything, but like somewhere along the way, someone had to teach me some shit. Right? Like someone had to sit me down and say like, that's messed up, or have you thought about it this way? Or like someone did have to invest in bringing me along. And still, like still today, I still have things to learn. And so do other people. And so part of building allies, right? And we know, we see where, you know, backlashes at least hit more obstacles or do not have the sort of total destruction uh, that they could is because people stand up together, right? And there is something, there's also something about it that is you're building the world you want to have, right? Where, you, and again, and it's not, not perfect, and obviously allyship in certain communities and certain issues is easier than others, and I'm not trying to paint this with a broad stroke, but I do think there is a part of it in there, right, about people being able to be curious, confused, ask questions, get answers, learn, grow, struggle, like as opposed to expecting you're either with us or you're against us, right? I remember where that rhetoric came from. It was from the right. So that, that to me is a piece, and I feel like sometimes we lose that piece now in, in, a, in, a, in a true fear state, right, for the moment we're in, um, but where we've forgotten to kind of have some grace and remember that we're supposed to be the side that believes in the goodness in people, that believes that people, all people can grow and change, that we are fundamentally optimistic about humanity. But that means actually extending it on a one-on-one -on -one basis too. I think, and right on the point, there's 
when someone is trying to tell you how to help or explaining it to you, it's actually, it's not explaining it to you. That's the differentiation. Someone cannot explain their experience or identity to you. They can only tell it. Um, and a lot of it is allies to really help is just have faith, um, especially um, intergenerationally when the youth are telling you how they need help or how they need you to act or what the direction we need to move in. It's not that you, they need to explain it in a way that makes it comfortable for you or makes you understand it or, oh, okay, I see that. No, you're listening to them so that they can tell you what to do. To be an ally is to have faith because there are going to be this, there are going to be these moments where you don't fully understand an experience or you don't fully trust that what they're saying is how they're feeling or the way we should be moving. But to be an ally, you have to hand over your autonomy just a little bit. You have to hand over that position of power. And to do that, to hand it over, to not lend it, to not platform it, to give someone your autonomy, you have to have faith in how they're going to choose to spend it and use it. Because the point, and I, I've experienced this so many times as a youth organizer, is when we have these youth-led movements, and we're a youth-led nonprofit, and we're actually youth-led, but to prevent that from being overtaken by adults who want to show us the way to go or how they want to fix the problems that they created is <laughs> painful. It's impossible almost. And so really the core thing to be an ally is to recognize that you're not sharing your power or helping someone out. No, you are putting yourself down a little bit because that's the only way that we're going to move forward. You are handing something over. And so just put some trust in not only queer people, but queer kids especially because there's literally no one else listening to them. The, the, uh, let me just add quickly to this because we're running out of time. The transgender community wouldn't be where we are today without the allies. There just weren't enough of us. And, um, and when we passed the first bill in 2011 and we had been lobbying the state legislator for seven, seven years of joint judiciary committee meetings, um, and when it finally passed and Governor Dukakis uh, signed it, and, and that was the first bill because we had to leave public accommodations off, um, off to get it through and we still didn't have 36 Democratic votes and all but one Republican vote. Um, but by the time the public accommodations vote came along, it was our allies, and that was the tough one, public accommodations, which is what we're, our society's based on, is where to go, the freedom to go to a restaurant or a hospital and not be denied entry or care. Uh, by that time, we had so many allies that we had to break it into portions, business allies, faith-based allies, progressive allies, LGBT group allies, and um, Today, and I know this has gotten out of hand a bit with the pronouns, um, the, you know, putting them on emails and um, everything socially. That, but originally that was when straight, as you use per, straight, um, people that are not LGBTQ um, put that on there uh, when they sign their signature to anything. It's about being an ally. And it's the way you're showing that you're an ally. Thank you. We have time for, let's do quick questions so we get both of you. Go ahead, please. Hi, my <coughs> name is Abby. I'm a student at the college. And hearing all of you talk about the work that you're doing, one question that I still have is about the things that get you through um, the work that you're doing and the moments when it's really hard, um, like the sustaining practices that sustain you. Okay, someone with a 30 second answer because we're running Day out of drinking? time. Day <laughs> 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 Sally. <laughs> that that said 30 help. seconds. And I, I would just honest. say it's important to have a support, ne support network uh, for whatever you do. And then in response to the previous question for allies, I just wanted to recommend a book, uh, actually not a book, but an essay by Bernice Johnson Reagan called Coalition Politics. It's in the book called Home Girls. Uh, highly recommended for an essay about allyship. And you have a book coming out tomorrow, isn't that right, Keith? Oh my God, I do. You didn't plug your yeah, own book. I have Come a book on. coming out tomorrow called That's because he's written six, so he forgets oh, no, so no, right. it's coming out tomorrow. I have a book coming out tomorrow called Quitting, Why I Left My Job to Live a Life of Freedom. And okay. uh, nothing to do are. with this topic, but check it out. Oh. Okay, our last question, please. Hi, Ian. Um, oh, I'm hi. sorry that you have gone through this with our class. And I want to know, leading on the ally, what can we as a class do to help you? How can we be allies to end this? 
because the disability community is going through the same thing and we need allies. And how can the LGBTQI, I hope I got all the initials correct, um, be allies for the disability community as well? And how can we join forces to quash hate? Good question. Come to the meetings. Um, um, I think to, to combine all those really quickly, I think that we have to, I, I think where I find support is in risk taking because we're, if you look at the institution, it, it just sort of wants you to sit in the corner, right? Um, and I think that you can be seduced into the privileges here and not take risks. So there's something about the, the students, the young students especially, who are taking real risks with new vocabularies. And, and that to me is what queerness is, right? A, a field of all possibilities where we can reinvent ourselves continually and uh, create new ways of being, right? That's what queerness means to me. So that's what gets me through is that I, get excitement out of taking risks sometimes. And it's difficult here because everything wants you to kind of like, you will lose privileges if you speak up. You will get your hands slapped. Well, lose them. And I think that's to, to my friend Shannon, which is a beautiful question, is you have to risk privilege. Those of us who are most uh, privileged by the systems of oppression have to do more to dismantle them, right? So you have to interrogate what that means for you. Are you willing to get uncomfortable? Are you willing to lose something by giving platform to somebody else or giving resources to somebody else? It's similar with the disability community. What all of these communities um, and, and, and the issues they're facing are totally intersecting. So um, I think where we, where, what we're looking at right here at Harvard is, um, just continuing to build the student support, right? And to build the student voices that say, we actually want these things to change. We're willing to um, build a coalition of student power because we know that students have power here, right? So um, I just want to remind, because I see a lot of young students here, and I think that that's where I get my inspiration because hope is also generative, right? It's like community, you ha it's active. You have to continue to work at it. And where I see hope is in the young generation sort of saying, you know what, no more status quo because our lives are on the line. Um, there, are bill there are 238 bills that are anti-LGBTQ in the country right now, right? That, are, that could be passed. A lot of them are dying, but some of them are passing through. And, um, and so I just think that if you have any privilege, you just can't sit around and stay silent. You can't sit around hemming and hawing, like get behind people, risk something, get queer yourself, right? What does is, what is queering yourself mean? Um, and I think that means to jump out of the sort of normative standards of all the institutions that we're a part of. Um, talk to me later. <laughs> I'm here. Well, on behalf of the Institute of Politics and everyone that helped put this on, including the Shorenstein Center, the Pride Caucus, the Co Office, Alumni Relations, we thank you very much for coming and thank you so much to our inspiring panel as well. A round of applause, please.